Keir Starmer is predicted to win and win big, with as many as 450 MPs at the next parliament. But what would that mean for the House of Commons? Two-thirds of all MPs would belong to the Labour Party, big enough not just for the government, but for opposition as well. Katie Balls writes in this week's Spectator cover piece that this will transform the way political debates are held in ways we haven't really started to discuss. So let's discuss them now. I'm delighted to be joined by John McTurnan, who is a former political secretary to Tony Blair. Now, John, you were a political secretary for Tony Blair back in the day. He was seen to have a pretty big majority in 97. But if you look at some of these MRP polls, we're looking at a majority of 250. Sometimes people say 450 MPs. Now, to put that into context, the House of Commons doesn't actually have room for 450 MPs. (laughs) And look, and... If Labour had 450 MPs, it could split into a party of 300 and a party of 150 Mm -hmm. and be the government and the opposition at the same time. And I still think in my bones, I feel the possibility of 500 is discounted too easily. Mm -hmm. I think this feels like a 1993 Canada uh, general Mm -hmm. election moment, a moment when the country moves so quickly, so solidly, that the government just evaporate, that the Conservative Party in Canada down to two seats. I think in, 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 in the UK, the possibility of under 100 seats is real because the mood in the public is they've switched away and the longer this goes on, the worse I think it gets. It's worth, it's worth talking a bit about Canada. I mean, there you had the Conservatives went from 198 seats yeah. to two, two. seats. Right? You will, now, why did that happen? Because the right was split, because a new party came yes. along called Reform. Yeah. And then Reform were saying that these Conservatives aren't really Conservative. Yeah. And because they had the first-past-the-post system, as we do, that allows big majorities. It also allows for pretty big collapses. And it's interesting to... I've been hearing Conservatives talk a lot about that. Uh, about and but basically, what happened there was the the Canadian Conservatives were basically they dissolved, they were gobbled, they merged reform. Eventually, they came back, uh, yeah. you know, like twelve years later. But it, so you, you you you're saying then that we could be, you know, right now it sounds crazy to talk about four hundred and fifty Labour, a hundred Tory. It, it could be it could be even bigger than that. A lot of coverage um, and, and until the really good piece that Katie's written, a lot of coverage in UK politics is all about what's happening on the right, mm. what's happening in the Tories, because they're the government, what's happening between the Tories and, and, and reform, because that's a challenge to the, the, the government. What's going undiscounted is that two-thirds of people in Britain want to vote left to centre. Mm. Labour, Lib Dems, Greens, Plaid, even the SNP, put them all together, you're talking about two-thirds of the electorate. And so there's a lot too much focus on what's going on on the right, for understand all reasons, and not enough thinking, well, what if this is a big shift? What if all of those two-thirds of the voters voted for whoever could get rid of the Tories, which is what happened in, in, in Canada, because the, uh, the Social Democratic and New Democrats, uh, NDP in Canada, they shrunk as well as the, the Tories. The Liberals were the beneficiaries of it, and Labour sitting in the middle of British politics look like they're going to be the beneficiary of this big mood and this move towards, well, let's get away from this fighting on the right. Let's actually sit as a kind of moderate centre-left government, progressive, with very pr- modest ambitions, but the, the mood for change. And is a mood for change going on in, in the electorate. Now, you worked for Tony Blair in his slightly more radical years. <laughs> it seemed to me as if he started out quite conservative, paradoxically. He became radical, yeah. Yeah, but because at the time, he didn't allow himself to think. In the same way that Keir Starmer, who's four years almost exactly in power, isn't going to really allow him to think. Uh, the thought experiments you're saying, he would say, no, John, shut up. We, we, might, we might blow it. Because look what happened in 92. The Sheffield rally, again, almost um, the, the anniversary there was recently. So when Labour comes across as cocky, when Labour comes across as the government incumbent, the voters think, mm, you're a bit arrogant, and they might change their minds. Look, yeah, L- L- Labour loses so much in its head, there's always, what if we lose? And that caution is there. And I think, look, Tony Blair only had one job in government, uh, and that was Prime Minister. And as he said, when he got into office as Prime Minister, he had massive power, but not really clear about the agenda. Mm-hmm. At the end, he had less power, but a much clearer agenda. And I, I remember sitting around the Cabinet table um, with other advisors discussing bringing in um, academies. And there's a lot of resistance about mm-hmm. academies, a lot of resistance about the radical part of the agenda. And I went, he's got to the top, he's had three elections, let him do what he wants. Mm-hmm. The thing about prime ministers is let them execute the power that they have. And I think that unleashing the real prime minister. So I think 
there will be a, there'll be a cautious manifesto, there'll be a cautious first term, but I do think you'll see, you, there are instincts that Keir has uh, which, are, which are going to be clear, but also there's dynamics in the, in, once you get a large parliamentary party, it has dynamics of its own, you have to manage your party. A lot of the Conservative government has been about managing the Tory party, not managing the country. But this won't just be a large uh, parliamentary party, we're talking about two-thirds of the House of Commons. So what then happens? How do you manage, not just a large party, but a party that's going to have so many MPs who are new to Parliament, who won't have set foot there before, and they might be thinking to themselves, look, we have now got this massive, perhaps unrepeatable moment of power, and yet all the time Starmer's being cautious, he's, he's still in his head, there's a mass of Tories, but look at the Tories, they're a squabbling rump, now is the time for radicalism. So it might be quite difficult to manage this, these hundreds of MPs who might be impatient for change, and understandably so. Look, I think that's right, and I think there's two, there's two things. One is you do have to, as much as you can, transmit downward. There's a discipline, there's a message discipline at the moment, there's a policy discipline at the moment, there's a tax and spend discipline. You have to bring that in, and when people come in, two-thirds of the Labour Party, Parliamentary Labour Party, will be new to the House of Commons, not just new to government. You can teach them a lot of things, but there's also, I think, a sense in which you have to accept this is going to be a government formed in the and governing in the second quarter of the 21st century. So a very different social dynamic, very different makeup, all coming in in one go, not coming in in 30 or 30 or 50 uh, e each election. A lot younger all, as well. A lot younger. And I think they have a set of expectations about policy or even common agreement across left and right that the green agenda is massively important. It's not arguable. Um, I think you see in you see the, the, the beginnings of something in what Jeremy Hunt's been doing, shifting away the burden of taxation from people who work. Now he'll never complete that shift. But what if Labour comes in with these younger generation of, uh, of MPs, renters, not homeowners, who care about renters, not homeowners, and look at pensioners with uh, inherited wealth um, by accident, I suppose the wealth of, uh, of housing, house value, you might see that opening up the possibility of not just shifting the burden of taxing work, shift the burden to taxing wealth. You start to solve a lot of problems in local government. During the pandemic, domestic house prices went up in value in the UK by two trillion pounds. Mm. Nobody worked for that. Well, isn't there a solution in there somewhere for social care, for local authority funding, for all kinds of issues that are, that are difficult for Labour? So I think the dynamic becomes not a left-right thing, but a modern and old thing. And that's the thing where lots of leaders to reform are modernisers. Very few of them have a modern generation behind them on such a scale. It's almost a bit like the 1945 moment when Labour went from a tiny party, which had been in coalition with, with, with Churchill and the Tories over the war, to being the majority party. That influx of new members, and that definitely has a momentum of its own, that you, you look hard to identify what the strands are, but it's a definite change. When we start to think about the new Labour tribes, because every large political movement will have, will have divisions, mm. Um, in your piece, you mentioned two interesting cleavages. One is geographical. Mm. You said there'll be quite a lot of sort of London and the South mm. East tribes, there'll be Northerners. Mm. Now their interests will not necessarily yeah. be aligned. So can, can you talk about that for a bit? Yeah, you look, at, you look at some of the projections of the MRP polls, which go down to constituency level and build up the numbers. Um, Scotland and Wales, which used to be huge contributors to the Labour's mm. majorities, um, smaller now because of devolution, Scotland because of the, the, the dominance of the SNP. Uh, you look at the North West delivering over 70 MPs probably, mm. but London, the big sweep in London, the Tories have they shown in their recent um, advert, they've given up on London, mm. so London may be 60 plus, but the big gain, the biggest gain of all regions, Labour has eight seats in the South East at the moment, it's going to have 30 new seats. So London South East, because a lot of the South East is a lot more like London now with people moving out because of house prices, um, working from home. You've got maybe 90 London South East MPs. It starts to swamp the North West. And then you look at, I counted, maybe 20 MPs who are going to be MPs outside London but have been London councillors. Mm -hmm. So the London mentality may be the dominant mentality, over 100. And so it means, in a sense, the dynamics of the Labour Party could be sorted. It used to be Scotland, Wales, Yorkshire sort out the whole of the Labour Party uh, by doing the numbers together. The biggest blocks, the North West and London, the South East. That could be productive because you might get a proper restoration of HS2. That's in both the interests of London and the South East and the North West. Or you might get conflict. But I suspect you'll get 
interesting imaginative demands for devolution, a different kind of devolution. And you'll see a different kind of Labour Party from the one that at the moment, kind of here though a London MP and one of a string of London lead, leaders that Labour's had recently, um, doesn't really talk about London, doesn't really talk about an offer to London. London may ask for um, something back after the election. And what about the prospect of a Corbynista rekindling? Not in Jeremy Corbyn himself, of course, but I mean, right now, take Zara Sultana, for example. She has been on her best behaviour, knowing that if she says so much as a sentence wrong, Keir Starmer is itching for an excuse to, to, to zap her. Uh, but she will, people like her will have safety in numbers, I imagine. No, but, but this is what I want to know. Do, do mm. you think that amongst the 450, one of the camps will be a socialist camp, a sort of far-left camp? See, I think the interesting thing about modern politics is if you are the dominant voice on a new media channel, you're much more influential than if you're not. So Trump came to power really on the back of Twitter. In a way, it, it mimics the way that um, Kennedy was a TV president. Mm -hmm. If you're great in a new media, and Zara Sultana, who you named, Zara Sultana and Nadia Whittam, uh, two MPs on the left, young women of colour, they are the, they're the biggest politicians in the UK on TikTok. Now, TikTok's a real channel for communication. If the, if the Labour leadership aren't there, and they're not really there, mm. and if the government aren't there, who's talking to the TikTok generation? Mm. It's the left. And there's something about the green politics that appeals to young people, which I think is where the, the, the younger members of the Socialist Campaign Group are drifting towards. And that makes a different challenge, because in himself, Keir's quite green. Ed Miliband's quite green. It's quite a green Labour front bench. They just haven't had the money to back it because of the constraints of public. So I think the influence of the younger generation of the left, if they, if they stick to the far left demands of nationalisation, they'll be marginal, not marginalised, but just won't be part of the conversation. If they move sense stage and go, look, we're talking to the public, we're talking in this way, and we have ideas that chime on the red-green axis, then you're talking about a different dynamic. And that's, I think, one of the issues. You'll only see what the Labour Party in government is like in government, and the Labour Party backbenchers will only reveal themselves in the dynamic of it. Amongst the 450, you know, the thing about Zara and Nadia is they don't just have channels, they've got views. What's the unity of, a, of analysis, of ideology amongst other members? Because Starism is yet to be formed. You know, Rachel Reeves clearly has secure economics, but the notion of what the social and the economic agenda are together, that's in play and I think clever young politicians will shape that. And at the moment, um, Keir Starmer is, feels the gravitational pull of the Conservatives. He yeah. doesn't want to move too far yeah. away from them. Now, when the Conservatives shrink to be 100, perhaps even yeah. 50, by what you're saying, that gravitational pull yeah. will fall. Yeah. And the gravitational pull of the two, 300 Labour backbenchers <laughs> will be yes. bigger. So it's difficult to tell right now what effect that's going to have, but it will be significant. Uh, look, and I, th I think that's right. And I think the pull of the country... So there may not be a lot of seats uh, for the Lib Dems or for the Greens, um, but there may be a lot of votes. And it may be that Labour, rather than guarding itself against losing votes to the right, will start to be concerned about well, what happens to, if we're the centre of politics, what about the Greens on one side and what about the Lib Dems on the other side? So the dynamic of politics may be voters expressing the desire for, lib for progressive uh, party and government, but also voting for alternative views of what progressive politics are. And that will be attention too, because no party can successfully govern and only manage its own co coalitions internally. It's got to manage the coalition of voters externally. And that I the idea we're moving towards potentially a government which is about, are we left-wing enough? Are we progressive enough? That changes the nature of the discourse too, and that's why it's really important to start looking at who are the backbenchers, what are the factions of the Labour Party, and look at them dynamically, what they'll be like going into the future. Thank you, John, and you can read about that and much more in Katie Balls' cover piece this week.